Good morning, Lifted Church. I'm so glad you are here today, and I want you to know that this series is going to help really improve your understanding, not only of Jesus, but of what Jesus has planned for each and every one of you that hold to a faithful relationship with him. We have gone through now chapter one of Hebrews. We have finished it. We started up with the introduction of chapter two, going one through four, and today we'll be reading from Hebrews chapter two, five, all the way to nine. Now, before I get started, there are people that are bigger than life, people that when you meet them, they change everything. Now, when you read the Bible, there's one character that has really impacted the Bible, I would say second to Jesus, and it's King David. David has just been one of those characters that of all the people that God talks about in the Bible, it's only David that he says, this is a man after my own heart. Now, if you fully take that in, that is a statement to have said about you. That is very heavy that God would place that on David's life and see that about him, even sometimes before maybe he even could fully comprehend or understand it. What I love about it is that as David's life would continue on, David would have many sons. And these sons would all have ambitions of their own, ambitions for the kingdom and how they would run it if they were in charge. There was times where people would try to usurp the kingdom, like Absalom, and he would get humbled and he would lose his life. There were other people that tried to take the kingdom. But there's one story that's the most interesting to me, and it's near the end of David's life. And Adonijah, his fourth son, decides that he is going to go after the throne. He is going to take David's throne. And he does so in David's older age. One of the most dramatic stories I would think in the Old Testament is this royal succession that's going on. King David was very old and everybody knew he wasn't gonna last much longer. So Adonijah, what he does is he gets the head of Israelite's army together and the senior priest, and he had himself proclaimed as king without David knowing. Now, if you take all of that in, David had previously promised Bathsheba that her son would be king. And when David heard what had happened, he had Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint Solomon king instead. And if you want to catch up on this story, you can go to 1 Kings and you can read the first two chapters. I only say that because everything turned on this one question. Who did the king intend to rule in the kingdom that was to come? This intent is very important because It shows what David wanted. It's the same question that's gonna parallel now into Hebrews chapter two. What did God intend for humanity? And to fully grasp that, appreciate that, understand that, we have to go all the way to the beginning of Genesis chapter one. And we have to see God's intent for humanity at the beginning of time. Let's see what God says in Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And then he says something right after it. Have dominion, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. See, Many of us will see that we are made in the image of God and God, he wants you to know that you out of all creation are his prized possession. You are his people that were set apart at the beginning 
of the conception of the world. God had decreed that man and women would rule together. And what's so insane is that we can see how God's intent wasn't honored by man. God's intent, while perfect, man was perfectly trying to subvert it. He wasn't successful because scripture is going to say that what the first Adam failed to do, Jesus accomplished on the cross. See, the big idea behind all of this is that God had plans for you at the beginning. His plan is that you would have authority and dominion. You would have the rulership over this very earth, not to be given away to angels, though angels existed, not to be given away to creatures, though creatures existed, to be given to humanity. And this is gonna play a big role in God's perfect intent because how many of you know if God plans it, you can't stop it? That if God's got a purpose and a destiny, you can try getting in front of it, you can try to subvert it, but there is nothing that you can do to stop God's plan from happening. And Jesus would be the fulfillment of that plan. Remember before the incarnation, we see in terms of the spiritual, but Jesus took on flesh and by taking on flesh, he took on humanity. And when he took on humanity, he did what the first Adam could not do. He lived the perfect life. He paid the ultimate price with his perfect blood and his blood redeemed mankind. This is an amazing feature that can only be brought to you by a relationship with Jesus and knowing him fully. And when we get to the story in here in Hebrews, Hebrews is helping us understand this and it's helping us see that Jesus wasn't just the God, Jesus is the God man. He took on flesh, he lived the perfect life and he did so without ever sinning. To fulfill the very pro prophecy of John the Baptist, behold the lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. We perfectly screwed up. We perfectly needed a savior to fix what we did. What I love about here is in verse five, he says this, he says, for he has not subjected to angels to the world to come that we are talking about, but someone somewhere has testified, what is man that you remember him? Take this into account that God in the beginning of time had you on his mind. At the beginning of time, he had it on his mind to see mankind flourish, increase and multiply, be fruitful. God has designed you to be fruitful. And when we're not fruitful, it's because of sin. It's because of sin and the impact of sin that actually shows up in the bearing of our fruit and the bearing of what we do and don't do. And what I love here in scripture is that we see this parallel being shown to us. He says, or the son of man that you would care for him. This son of man is a reference to whom? To Jesus. Now, every single Jewish boy during the time that Jesus would come would have been waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah that had been prophesied through different parts of the Old Testament. The Messiah who had been promised. And there were different parts that you could quote, but there was no greater than the Psalms. That's why the writer of Hebrews decides, I'm going to use the Psalms to show you not only the messianic hope, but the messianic promise. And this messianic promise is going to be completely and fully revealed in Christ Jesus and fulfilled in Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus alone. How do I know that? Well, we can go and we can see that this passage that is referenced by the author of Hebrews is a direct quotation from Psalm 8, 4 
through six. In Psalm 8, four through six, just to read it here so that you can fully appreciate the text, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. Now, when we go back to the New Testament and we read this in light of what we just learned, he says, you made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. What's so interesting here is that we can see that everything in this world, whether you know it or not, God is completely within control. God is sovereign over your circumstances. God is sovereign over the ups and downs of this world. And no matter how hard the devil tries to thwart the plans of God, no matter how he thinks he's won, every single time the devil thinks he's won, Jesus steps in and reminds him, not on my watch. Jesus has such a great plan for humanity. And what the writer of Hebrews wants you to see is that beautiful plan, that beautiful inheritance. Now, I have a story of inheritance because when my great granddad passed away, he was my mentor. He was the guy that was bigger than life for me the guy that would get me to read the Bible. I had become a Christian in 1999 and he would pass away sometime in 2000, 2001. And during that short period of time, even before then, he was one of my best friends. But up until that period of time, he would encourage me to read the Bible, encourage me to see if I was following God's ways, if I was actually listening to God, not just going through the motions. He cared about my relationship, and I'm so glad for him in my life. And what was so honoring about that was there was a time where my dad was church planning during that period of time, and we got the news that he had passed away. Now, there's crushing moments, but this moment was just crushing. I don't think I've ever cried that hard my entire life. And then we go to the funeral, and at the funeral, my grandma had a check for him that was given to by her father, my great granddad. And that check, guys, was for $10,000. This is right after 1999, 2000, somewhere in that period of time. Imagine $10,000 when you have three boys, bills to pay, your husband decided to do church planning, it's financially tight, you don't know where your groceries are gonna be coming from, you don't know how you're gonna pay rent, and your husband decides that his church plant is a priority. Now, you could say it was a point of contention between my mom and my dad at that period of time. If they ever want to share the story with you, they can't. But from my perspective, the bird's eye view, what I learned that day was even though it created a lot of contention, there was some issue around money, dad really believed in God's kingdom. Dad really believed in what God was doing then and what God is doing now. And at the time when you are wanting things and you see things about what you're not getting and what you are getting, it's really easy to judge the person that has to make the hard decisions. It's really easy to judge your father during that period of time. And I couldn't fully appreciate it until I got older. Dad ends up using the $10,000 because they had exactly $10,000 due in rent. And God gave him a check so that he could continue the church. Now, for me, that speaks wonders on my dad's character about how he saw things. Now, many of you look at a physical inheritance, but what my dad taught me that day was a spiritual inheritance. He taught me about a spiritual inheritance that matters even more than the physical ones that I see. Because you, ladies and gentlemen, might be leaving something special for your kids. You might have a legacy and you are trying to leave your stamp on this world and you are trying to put your kids in a better position than you were put in. But you wanna put your kid in the best position possible? Give them Jesus. Give them Jesus. Lift it up. Lift it up in your marriage. Lift it up at the schools that you go to. Lift it up in your careers. Lift it up in everything that you do so that in every way that they don't see you trying to grab the glory, but they see you giving the glory back to God. And what that does is it leaves a rich 
and beautiful inheritance, not something physical, even though there's gonna be some physical components to it, but spiritual, something that only Jesus can hold and Jesus can give and Jesus can actually come through on. Because if you don't know this yet, everything's gonna fade. But the word of God will remain forever. We have to teach our young people and our old people, all people, to hide God's word in your heart. You want to remain, you need to remain steadfast and faithful to the things of God. You don't want to fade away. Hold on to God, and he'll hold on to you. This is a beautiful truth that we learn through this story that we see played out for us in Hebrews He tells us, he says, this was Jesus, the Messiah. He was the one that was holding the old and bringing everything to the new. He is the one that takes the old and makes it new. He's the reason why we can even become a masterpiece to begin with. He's the one that actually did what Adam couldn't do and he subdued sin once and for all, being able to say, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? Yes, we live in a world that is impacted by sin, But yes, because of God, we can be free from that impact. There is a freedom in Christ because the Bible says to whom the Son of God sets free, you are free indeed. Jesus came so that you can say no to ungodliness, yes to his righteousness, yes to Jesus. And when you learn to give Jesus honor and glory and respect and reverence and you begin to obey him in your life, what he begins to do for you is he sets up for you a beautiful inheritance, not just in the here and now, but in the future. And this is what I wanna talk about today because this kingdom that is in the future is not some pie in the sky. When we get to heaven, we're at a beautiful resort. There are wieners roasted on there on a fire. You got your beans there. You got your nice little buffet there. You put your food there, whatever you have, your arroz con pollo, Whatever you want, you start to think, oh man, heaven's gonna be amazing. I'm gonna have a recliner chair, a lazy boy, and I'm gonna be able to chill because man, I have been working so hard for my living. And some of you believe that and it's sad because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually says that you are gonna have authority. You are gonna have power and you are gonna have dominion. That the very promise that was given in Genesis was actually fulfilled in Christ. And when you understand and realize that, that Christ is now going to be that second Adam, he's going to sit and do what the first Adam could not, then you begin to understand that Jesus will be on the throne, that in the future during the millennial reign, he will not only be on the throne, he will sit on that throne forever and no one will ever succeed him. No one will ever take his power. But yet those who understand having a relationship with Jesus means also getting to become a prince and a princess in his kingdom, becoming a children, a son, and a person of God. Now, I want you to go to scripture with me, and we're going to see right now in Matthew 19. I need everyone to give me some Baptist air conditioning today. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. I need you guys to move there. For those of you who don't know Matthew, it's the very first book of the New Testament. Here in Matthew 19, verse 27 It was right after the rich person said, how can we do this for the kingdom of heaven? I have the needle, that whole thing. We see here in verse 27, Peter was saying, hey man, I'm still here. I'm following you. I I get sometimes the rich people can't. I get sometimes the arrogant people can't. The proud people can't. The 12, we're still here. And this is what Peter says. Peter responded to him, see, we have left everything. Jesus, look what I've done for you. I have sacrificed so much for you. I know none of you have ever done that before in your prayer life. But Peter says, I have left everything and followed you. So what will there be for us? Ultimately, what's in it for us? What is our inheritance? What do I get out of it? Out of following a relationship with you as if salvation is not enough. What we see here in verse 28, Jesus said to them, very verily, truly, truly, I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit 
on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And here in verse 29, it says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers, sisters, fathers, or mothers, children or fields, because of my name, will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. And then he says, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Do you know what he's talking about here, ladies and gentlemen? Jesus is talking about the millennial reign. How do I know that? Well, let's read Revelation chapter 20, verse four. Revelation 20, verse four, he says, then I saw thrones, this is John speaking. Then I saw thrones, people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God who had not been worshiped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for how many years? A thousand years. And then in verse five, he says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Do you understand that in the New Testament, the millennial reign is talked about more than any other period? Jesus tells you about it when he references the sheep and the goats. He tells you about it when he references the wheat and the tares. He tells you about it when he comes back, what it's gonna be like. He even references it when he talks about the parable of the talents. And he says, to one I gave this many, and to one I gave this many. And what we learned even about the parable of the talents is that God has given each and every one of you something. And these are people that knew the master, that knew the Lord, that knew the Savior, that said verbally and out loud that they were saved, that they had a relationship with the Lord. But what did we learn about even that lesson? that the wicked, lazy servant despised his inheritance, despised what had been given to him, what had been allotted to him. And not only did he despise it, he dug a hole in the ground. And what happened when the master came back? He cast him out into utter darkness. But there we also see the flip side where the people who did the right things, who followed God, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So there we see the two qualifications for the people who end up in a millennial reign. They have to be good and nobody can be good without God following his decrees, following his rulership in their life, which is making him Lord of your life and surrendering to his cause surrendering to his ways, surrendering to his will. And then on the flip side, being faithful. Oh, to be faithful. Faith is something that we do not always cherish in this world. We think success is what we can bring to the table in terms of money and success is what we get to, to do with our own lives, but success is what we do for God. Do you guys know why David was a man after God's own heart? This is the most simplest answer, and it's the right answer, I promise you, because he was faithful. I know you want something bigger than that. All these theologians, why is David the man after God's own heart? Because nobody had to ask him to do things for God. The deep down inside, David loved God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul, and when God searched his heart, he found a faithful individual that served him out of a genuine place. If God were to search your heart today, what would he find? If God were to search your mind today, what would he find? 
If God were to watch your actions and the way that you live out your will and the way that you do things, are you circumventing God's process and rulership over your life or are you in submission to his process and you are following what it is that he wants you to do because God has put a proclamation on your life and you are either living in that holy assignment or are you doing things your own way? And doing things your own way is not a new thing. Adam did it and see how it played out for him. Saul did it and see how it worked out for him as a king. David understood at a a core level that it's about being faithful. And here, when we get to this idea in Hebrews and we go back to his word, we see that in Hebrews, this millennial reign is oozing out of the book because we can think that Hebrews is just about justification. It's about me being saved, but then what do you do after you're saved? Why am I still here? My dad likes to say this, that if it's just about being saved, the moment you accept Jesus, you're gonna shoot up like a rocket, go straight to him. You aren't just here for your own salvation. You are here to end the work of the devil with God, and God is going to end it once and for all with a loud shout from his own voice. And when he does so, guys, you're either gonna be on his side or gonna be on the devil's side. Let me tell you what happens with the devil. He loses in the end. He is a defeated foe. So why do we need to be educated? Why do we need to understand this beautiful inheritance? Because it's the inheritance, guys, that it's all about. God has something for each and every one of you, and you are going to enter into a millennial reign, and you see some people aren't gonna get what they thought that was gonna be given to them. There are some people that after the millennial reign are gonna get into heaven by the skin of their teeth thinking, oh man, I have arrived, look at this. And then you're like, what am I gonna get? And God's like, you get nothing. You get me, but you get nothing else. This is gonna be such a sad day for certain people because they're going to have thought in their minds, well, all I thought I had to do is make a decision and All I thought I had to do is do a little bit. And there are people that God is gonna honor just in the fact that not that they were honoring, but that God honors his promises, that God honors his word. And so there are people that are gonna, like I said, get into heaven on the skin of their teeth, but there are also a lot of people that are gonna go before the Lord and say, I deserve to get something. And they're gonna say, Lord, Lord, I did these things in your name. And he's gonna say, depart from me. I never knew you. This is all about the millennial reign. And this is hard for my heart to swallow because one, we have to take into account that hell's a real place. And that if we don't preach the gospel, people are gonna go there. And two, every great truth bears great responsibility. You are not ignorant. You know that God deserves all praise. You know that God deserves all all things, yet somehow in our minds, we think, well, because we can get away with it, then it's okay. Because we haven't been disciplined, it's okay. Because things haven't happened right away, it's okay. Well, let's see what God's word has to say about it. He says here, for in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him to him. Have you ever met someone that's really skeptical about God and they use language like it seems? It seems like the God that you talk about isn't the God that I see in the world. They might even use a question like this. If God is so good, why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever had that said to you, and not knowing what to say back? Well, you can take them to Hebrews chapter two. You can take them to this very verse, and you could say, it might seem like God is not in control, but let me tell you he is. And let me tell you how I know he is. This is how I know he is. Not because sin has entered in the world, but because Jesus has entered in the world. 
and that when Jesus steps into the human believer's heart, he changes them from the inside out and he gives them the ability to say no to sin. That is the beauty. We are impacted by sin, but we do not have to be completely torn apart by sin. We can have God take sin, put it on the cross, and be paid for. He has made atonement for you. He has paid the price for you. And he has paid the price in such a way that it, it, it extends beyond what you think in terms of time. It extends and what you think in terms of powers. There is nothing that God's blood cannot accomplish on the cross. And so whatever sin that you think is powerful, let me give you a newsflash today. God's grace is more powerful than any sin that exists in this world. Look no further to Jesus for grace. Look no further to Jesus for your forgiveness. Look no further to Jesus for your help because he is not just your helper. He is your savior and he is the savior of the world. And this is the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful point the author of Hebrews wants us to see. And he has told you from chapter one about the son of man. He's told you in chapter one about the son of God, but he waits all the way to this part in chapter two to use the very first time in Hebrews, this word, Jesus, the Lord saves. This is such a beautiful reference that when we take it to heart, we see he's saying, yo, we don't yet see everything subjected to him, but we do see Jesus. And if you see Jesus, you can see the promise. If you see Jesus, you can taste the promise. How do I know that? He says here in scripture about this taste, he says, he made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone. Now, if you're like me, I love to eat. And I mean, thank God every day for my taste buds. COVID-19 did a number on me. For like five months, I couldn't taste things. I cried. Food, eating, not the same. We make it a thing to eat. I go to Costco. I show them my Costco membership. Not just any, I'm a, pre I'm a premier member, all right? I paid a little bit more so I could use the website and get discounts. And I go there with my son, Benji, and the girls go one way, the boys go with me, and I get Benji on the cart, and we're moving around, and Benji, he brings me samples. It's so good. Because they can't say no to a kid. I know I can have one, but he can have like 20, which means we split it 50-50. And as we're getting really fat there, we're tasting and sampling, but I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that's not what's being said in the text. God isn't talking about you having a sample and saying, oh, well, you sampled Jesus. That was a great Sunday message. I love sampling Jesus. And we have so many people in Christianity today that are sampling, but they're not actually fully partaking. This idea was a metaphor in Hebrews and the Hebrew people would have understood it not to be a sample, but to fully partake. So it's one thing to try the sample, but everybody knows at Costco, you get the sample so that you go back into the freezer and you buy that and you bring the whole thing home. God wants to bring all of himself to you. Not so that you get a part, not that you get half, but you get all of Jesus. And if you get all of Jesus, it's all that you need. Are you getting it yet? And this idea of taste death is that he did it for all so that all could taste glory. And that glory is something that he has. And we taste glory because he is glory incarnate. He is the radiance of God. And when you appreciate the text here, you can see that the writer of Hebrews was saying that he was made lower than the angels. Take this in for a moment. Before he was incarnate, he identified in the deity of just being God, but not yet the God man. But to take on humanity meant being lower than even the angels. And now to fully appreciate the text, when you go all the way into Philippians, not only did he do it, he emptied himself, taking on the likeness of man. He humbled himself. Nobody had to humiliate Jesus. Jesus did it on his own. He did what the first Adam could never do. 
he conquered so that he could be that person to bring in for humanity that dominion again. In this reign, so if he is ruling and we are reigning, that only happens because of what Jesus did. And when we read it in light of scriptures, then we actually begin to take it in in a different way. And we see here that it's actually for us. It's not against us. What I wanna see here, I'm trying to move to it right now. In Romans 5, 17, it says, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. So we see how death came in. We see how sin has impacted the world. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? That's Romans 5, 17. You guys need to know that you only reign because God rules. And if God doesn't rule, you don't reign. This is such a big premise for us to think about our own power where we think that we are powerful. I am the captain of my ship. I am the author of my life. No, Jesus is the author and the finisher. And Jesus is the ruler and we reign because he rules. This is a truth, this is a principle that we need to live and die on because this is what it's all about if we are to receive a great inheritance. I had created four stages today that every follower of Christ needs to realize if you're truly going to understand the big picture, you guys need to lock this in. And stage number one, we've already gone through our dominion. We saw that in Genesis. Stage two, we've already walked through about the death. That is our fall. All of us need to understand that we have fallen from great heights, that we had a great destiny. In Genesis 1, we had dominion and we lost that dominion, but we gained dominion through Jesus. And when Jesus lives in you, you can reign in this world. It's a beautiful truth. And then to point number three, our redemption. We were saved We were redeemed, we were justified, we were made right before the creator. You know, scripture says in Ephesians, and this was something that blew my mind when we're talking millennial reign and taking all this together in Hebrews, and I know we're doing a lot of theological lifting right now, but he says here, and God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, the millennial reign, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Paul would use in Christ Jesus so many times to help you understand, like shake it into you. It's not because of you. It's because of him. It's because of what he did for you that you can be here today. Because we know that Jesus, he could have said, you know what, I'll start over. I'll just do this all over again. I'll create a new reality, one that is not bent towards sin, but one that wants to do what I tell them to do. But instead, Jesus steps into humanity. He becomes sin, right? He takes on sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became sins for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. Scripture. And when we grasp that and we put it together here, then we can see what he's saying, that though they were made lower than the angels for a short time so that God's grace, he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. All of this climaxes to one great ending that we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels has now been crowned with glory and honor. He is our promise. He is God's ultimate intention for us. That yes, Satan had a plan in the beginning, but man, Jesus had a better plan. And you can't stop Jesus's plans. That when Jesus has a plan on your life and he's got a plan on your family, that you don't wanna get in front of that and you don't wanna mess with that. You want to allow that to take its course. Because behind every plan of God is a blessing. 
And then behind every person that shirks the plans of God, they lose a blessing. Do you know that God, he says very rarely he hates people in the Bible. He's a loving God. But he says, Esau have I hated. Jacob have I loved. Why does he hate Esau? What did Esau do? Esau was flippant about his inheritance. Esau was flippant about his birthright. You know what your birthright as human beings is? To have dominion, to reign and to rule, but to do so under God's sovereignty, under God's protection, under God's rulership. And like I said, when God rules, you reign. And man broke God's rulership and so they stopped reigning. And angels would do that which man was promised to do. And you have a group of people that are diminishing the impact here in Hebrews, which was the very first heresy that was coming into the church. And they were doing so because they were saying, maybe Jesus was a phantom, like a little ghost. He he wasn't really physical. They were taking away his humanity. And some people take away his humanity and they leave him just God physically. But you need both 100% man, and 100% God, and those two things come down together, and he does so to fulfill prophecy, to fulfill scripture, to fulfill his word, so that he would become the propitiation of sin, that he would become the very sacrifice necessary to make a way for salvation, to make a way for redemption, but ultimately, what's the last point today? To make a way for our inheritance, Everything is leading up, not just that you are redeemed, not just that you're saved, not just that I'm a Christian and you're not. No, that you have fallen in love with Jesus so much that you have gotten a heart like his. And until your heart reflects his heart, there's still work to be done. And the inheritance that you receive is that you get to live with your father in your father's house. You get to be one with Jesus. The Trinity invites you into their circle. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he grafts you in. He grafts you into his special possession, the 12 tribes. Ladies and gentlemen, you are Gentiles. You are that 13th tribe that Paul speaks to. You are those that were outside of the promise, but because of Ephesians, he's torn down the wall of hostility so that you guys could be gathered in the Gentiles so that that moment would happen, that all Gentiles would bow the knee so that the future would actually be fulfilled, that every knee will bow. Guys, that is the great God guarantee. God guarantees that one day all people are gonna have to do this. And you either do it by choice or by force. There's no greater force than God. But that force, no matter how you look at it, is love. And he loves you, his creation. And he doesn't love you just to stay here, broken. But he loves you so much that when you humble yourself at the foot of his cross, he will lift you up. And he doesn't just lift you up in any way. He lifts you up to heights that you can't even dream of. He lifts you up to heights in the future that you can't even imagine. Whatever you feel going through life and you feel insignificant in your role, insignificant in your work, insignificant in your marriage, insignificant with your kids, God has great significance held for those who hold out for him. And if you can see that, you can understand that why would you turn to the left or the right? Why would you look backwards? Keep lifting up Jesus. And if you lift up Jesus, he's gonna draw all people unto him. If you keep lifting up Jesus, he's gonna fix things around you. If you keep lifting up Jesus and you look towards Jesus, even though it might not seem to the outward people like God is in control, let me tell you, he is perfectly in control. He is perfectly sovereign over your situations and he is perfectly working right now in your hearts if you let him. Because the only thing that doesn't work when you go before God is your proudness, your pride. 
The Bible says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And we know from scripture, it's this grace that appears at the millennial reign. And it's the grace that Jesus gives to those who are faithful and good to his kingdom. No one preached about the kingdom more than Jesus. He was about his father's house. He was about his father's rule. And because of that, the father saw it fit to make him the ruler of all things. Jesus needs to reign supreme in your heart. If you haven't given him your heart, what are you waiting for? Don't just stop at salvation. Understand that you have a great promise. So if today you haven't made a decision for Jesus, let's make that right before the Lord. Let Jesus into your heart. But when you take that first step, I'm telling you, it's one of a million because you are going to be moving forward like you never have before. And you're not gonna wanna just stay at the doorstep of salvation. You are gonna wanna run to whatever it is that God has for you. And I want you to run with zeal. I want you to run the race with faithfulness. I want you to run and I don't want you to look back because what behind you is not as great as what lies before you. God has a great glory for those who remain faithful and steadfast to the things of God. God has a great destiny for those who can look forward to the things that God is doing. And yes, you may not be able to see it right now, but God, he is working a new thing in your life if you let him. He is making provisions for you if you can see him. And whether you can see him or not, they are happening. And only those who are faithful are actually enjoying them. Because God, he holds out for those who are faithful to him because it pleases him. If today you haven't made a decision, honor him today with your life. Give him your heart. The Bible says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God the Father raised him from the dead and know that one day he will raise you too. That is scripture. That is what God's word says, save someone not raising your hand, not writing it on a card, believing in your heart that Jesus is Lord and Savior over all. When you can do that, that's the demarcation moment. That's that moment where you are born again. That's the moment the Holy Spirit comes in. He baptizes you with his power and his glory and his honor. And he gives you the ability to to tear down strongholds. He gives you the ability to say no to ungodliness. He gives you the strength that is necessary because before in your sin, you were weak, but in his grace, you are made strong. And in that moment, when you do that, God has the victory over your life. If that's you today, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to confess with your lips. Say, Jesus... I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. But today I turn. I turn away from living life my own way. And I come to you and I ask you, I beg you, forgive me of my sin. I realize my sin has been keeping me from you. But I also realize that you made a way through your son. So Jesus, I'm asking to take my sin, to put it on your cross and to have your blood cover me, protect me and keep me in you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you for resurrecting. Thank you for conquering. And thank you for coming to me and giving me life. From this point forward, Jesus, I commit my life to following you with everything that I have, because now I know you are my savior. You are my Lord. You are my friend. I don't want anyone looking around yet. If you made that decision right now, I need you to do this. And it's very important because the Bible says, if you will not declare me before people, I will not declare you before my father in heaven. The biggest moment isn't faking it till you make it. The biggest moment is when you are authentically real with your own life. When you're done playing games and you give it all to Jesus because you realize he is all. If you're giving Jesus your heart today without anyone looking around the room, I just want you to lift up your hand. I gave Jesus my heart. I gave Jesus my heart. Amen. 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 I see hands lifted up all around the room. I see hands lifted up all around the room. Jesus is one today. 
And if you accept Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, the next step, be obedient. Don't look back. One of my favorite songs in the Bible says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That's your song today. That's your life song today. Get baptized. Tell the world, I am not ashamed of the glory of God. I'm not ashamed of what God did for me on the cross. I'm not ashamed because it's all about him. As you guys look up to me today, I want you to know that you have a great inheritance in Christ. You have something special, something worth dying for, something worth living for. So my call to action to you today is live for Jesus with everything that you are. Be blessed. Thank you so much for tuning in on this Sunday morning on Lifted Church Live. And guys, if the Holy Spirit touched your heart, if you were convicted listening to this message, and if you made a decision to give your heart to Christ today, I encourage you to sign that Connect card. George, why do we sign the Connect card? Matthew, I'm so glad that you asked. The reason why we ask you guys to fill out the Connect card is that, hey, if you made that decision to accept Jesus in your heart, we want to make sure that you fill out the Connect card so we know who you are to be able to pour into you, mentor you, and to guide you to where you need to be. More on that, maybe you made a decision to go get baptized. We want to make sure that we have leaders to reach out to you so we can make that happen as soon as possible. More on that, if you have a gift that God has given you, we want to make sure that you can use it here at Lifted Church to the very best of your ability. That being said, guys, we want you to keep up. We want you to stay updated. So guys, follow us on our socials. Follow us at, at Lifted Church on Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube. We want you to stay updated and know everything that's going on here at Lifted Church. And guys, with all that being said, we're so glad to have had you today on this beautiful Sunday morning, tuning in to Lifted Church Live. We'll see you next Sunday.